Real pleasure to be here. Sorry, I wasn't at the introduction. I was in the green room just checking the tech, but um, very exciting um, day that you've got some really great talks. So really pleased to be here. So I am going to share my screen. So let's go to the desktop. Um, so I should have, what do I have? Have I got a PowerPoint up? You, so can you see my PowerPoint now? Yes. Yeah, great, okay. So, so yes, so I have been, um, I started off in, in this business when it was interactive multimedia in the uh, 19, mid 1990s with the BBC Interactive Television Unit, which was the world's first broadcast company to embrace these evolving um, computer-based technologies. And uh, I remember they the first show on television that had a web link at the end, and it was from uh, Illuminations. So uh, I started off in video disc, moved on to CD-ROM, and then on to dial-up, and then broadband. Um, and yeah, so I've been thinking I've been thinking about this for a, a long time, and in a way, complexity has always been what I'm interested in, and the multiple and the, the multiple screens and the human computer interface that enable you to kind of engage with stories and ideas in uh, new new ways. So yeah, I'm talking today about steps towards embracing complexity. There's still steps towards because embracing complexity is a sort of lifelong endeavor really um, that we need to check in with ourselves. I'm going to try and make the case as to why we need to embrace complexity first. So this is, um, I'm based in Bristol at the University of the West of England. And this is a, um, a spin-off company that's come out of um, the kind of research areas that we've been working in. It's a company called Supersum that specifically deal with wicked problems for a complex world. And they've just got a nice statement on their website saying it's easy to say we live in a complex world. <clears throat> Many problems are in fact just merely complicated. So, you know, in theory, with enough effort, money and the application of best practice, we can find a solution. However, some problems, particularly societal problems, are very different in nature and solutionerism on its own won't work. So these problems are hard to define. They have no definitive solution and they're defined as wicked problems. So uh, wicked problems um, it's about staying with the trouble, as Donna Haraway would say, and, and just, you know, they keep evolving. So a good example of this would be climate change, you know, that we, we, we can't predict exactly what we're going, will happen. We're trying to model it. We're trying to come up with technological solutions, but those on their own, I think it's clear we need more than that. We need some, you know, we need to change and we, we need to change the way we think about things and we need a what you'd call in the academic world some kind of paradigm shift in our thinking so uh, that's what interests me about interactive documentary and how that might help so just a little provocation so these are the kind of these networks are, are popping up all over the world this emergence network is coming out of india and it's a group of curators uh, doing a research inquiry into the otherwise. And they're just asking, what if the way we respond to the crisis, the crisis I'm talking about here being climate, is part of the crisis? So what if our solutions or our ways of thinking uh, are not that productive um, in terms of helping us to address the situations we find ourselves in? So linking that to storytelling, um I look, um, I find that literary theory is actually more advanced and the novel and the written text is often more advanced in thinking about narrative and new approaches to narrative that perhaps are fit for the 21st century. Uh, we've got very established ways of working in filmmaking. You know, we've got large studio systems. 
we've got things pulling towards certain models and certain ways of thinking about narrative. But Olga Tokarczuk is, um, is a novelist and she won the Nobel Prize in 2018. And in this talk, she kind of lays down the gauntlet about what, what the problem is, what the challenge is. And she just came up with this. She said, we lack ready narratives, not only for the future, but even for a concrete now, for the ultra rapid transformations of today's world. And I don't think anyone would deny, you know, things are moving very fast. It's it's hard to get a grip on what's happening or what, what the likely futures are. There's all these multiple scenarios. If we do this, this could happen. If we do this, you know, it's a, it's a complex world. It's not that the world hasn't always been complex, but I think we're beginning, we're beginning to see that we need to understand that complexity more or we need to embrace it more to kind of work out, you know, how to navigate it. So she said, we lack the languages, we lack the points of view, the metaphors, the myths and the new fables. And this is the key point. She said, yet we see frequent attempts to harness rusty anachronistic narratives that cannot fit to the future. And that's the bit that I find troubling, you know, harnessing rusty anachronistic narratives, narratives perhaps of the 20th century, narratives before we understood that, um, you know, the, the kind of idea of progress and the idea of constant growth, you know, what was a problem um, and that we, we need to kind of address that and think about different models, which obviously um, there's all sorts of cultures that, you know, pre kind of full on capitalism uh, ha have a more sustainable way of engaging with the world. And I have a background in anthropology. So there's there's a lot of interest now in indigenous knowledge systems and, and narratives, which I'll talk more about in a bit. But th this this kind of challenge, the, the rusty anachronistic narratives, you know, can link to the strong manned politics, to the kind of um, empires and the battling of empires uh, that, that, you know, obviously is is quite troubling um, because it, it's leading to all sorts of problems on the ground and when we should be working together collectively to, to solve problems. So that is the collaborative idea behind what I'm talking about. So this again, you know, this is coming out of scholarship, but there's a lot of talk in documentary now and also in filmmaking, TV production with um, schemes like Albert, which is about, you know, making product projects much more sustainable and carbon count and you know how we can create narratives that are not based in consumption and in extraction that aren't you know taking things out like exploitative um using up resources and also exploiting people so that's one issue then this is the big chestnut just i'm not saying dramatic narratives and the idea of narrative being conflict based i'm not saying we need to get rid of those um, because that is, you know, that is a part of human nature and working through conflict, through fiction and all the rest of it, you know, is, is a way to work things out and to face up to things and to think things through. So I'm not saying we should get rid of dramatic narratives, but I'm saying we might question whether dramatic narratives as an approach are always fit for purpose, whether it's one size fits all, whether that is fundamentally what human nature is and whether there's other types of approach to narrative and story that aren't so conflict driven that we can draw on um, and linking to this idea of care narratives based on care and on sustainability and on um, having a more um, harmonious relationship with our environment rather than the kind of great heroic journeys that put people at the centre and put individuals at the centre. Um, so my provocation is that polyphonic and transformative narratives need to be part of the picture. I'm not saying these are the way forward and that we should get rid of all other types of narrative, not at all. But I'm saying that we need to have these need to be at the table um, alongside, you know, the more established forms of dramatic narrative that are so prevalent in um, 
filmmaking and and television and you know our media forms and in newspapers and all the rest of it in journalism so i'm arguing for to to think about these types of narratives as as alternatives what they might mean and where they might be useful and that's that brings me back to my interest in interactive documentary so just um for those who might be interested to follow this up, Donna Haraway comes out um, as, as an academic uh, working across the arts and sciences who was at the University of Santa Cruz in California. And this, she has made a film called Storytelling for Earthly Survival, which is about her approach to storytelling and the types of stories that she thinks we need. Um, and this is a an interview discussion of the film with uh, two you know big twentieth century philosophers Bruno Latour and Peter Weibel. So that's just something interesting for people to follow up. Um, and then another thing, it, this is a very small little book um, written by Ursula Le Guin that Donna Haraway refers to called the Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction, and she makes a really simple point in it that if we look at human history, you know, it wasn't that long ago that we were hunter gatherers and the clues there in the name, there were, you know, hunting and gathering were kind of both core aspects of the human endeavor. And she makes the point, why are so many of our stories more based on the idea of hunting, the idea of the spear, the idea of conflict, the idea of, you know, going out into the world and, bringing home your prey and feeding your family. And she just says, what about all the other stories of gatherers, the more kind of female stories traditionally, uh, the stories around the hearth, the stories of care, you know, those narratives, you could say are seen as a bit boring and um, they have been suppressed in, um, in recent times. And she just argues that we need, if we're going to have narratives of care, collaboration and sustainability we should take those narratives seriously and and we should think that you know they're just as heroic you know the narratives of care are the heroic narratives perhaps that we need to navigate the situation we find ourselves in so i just i just think it's quite a nice a nice conceit it's a nice idea and it's a really accessible book it's you know only 80 pages um so that's just another another thing for people to follow up. So and then this book has just come out of the Open Documentary Lab in um, MIT, which is kind of like um, a sister organization for the work I do in Bristol with IDOX, an interactive documentary. And um, they Kat Cisek ha has orchestrated this big um, research project on co-creation. And this is the book that's come out of it. And she just makes the point that co-creation and collaboration are as old as cave paintings. There was, you know, they go right back in human history. But why do we keep having to argue for these models, you know, as as business models in our storytelling um, processes and methods? So there there is this movement really developing now for co-creation. And she has a co-creation studio at MIT and is bringing in lots of indigenous scholars. And indigenous artists to work at MIT with the coders and the people who are designing our futures. So there's some really interesting conversations going on on there around the urgency of collective wisdom. So uh, the good news: this is I teach in Bristol, and I really enjoy doing teaching alongside research. And there's our filmmaking students, um, a group of them. The good news is that. I find, you know, I, I think young people get it. And I think that this is another provocation that literacies are shifting and that the way young people are consuming media is, is more, I mean, we worry about social media and there's all sorts of reasons, good reasons for worrying about social media in relation to attention, in relation to the economic models behind it, to the mysterious algorithms, all the rest of it. But there's another side to this, which is encouraging uh, a less linear, a, a different way of engaging with story, more nested narratives. If you think of things like YouTube, 
you know, my son's 18. He does a lot of his, he's done a lot of learning on YouTube. And it's kind of, to some extent, it is changing the way he thinks. And I think he does think in a more interconnected way, which means when he's doing his A-levels, he finds it quite hard just to think he's doing sciences, just to think biology or just to think chemistry or just to think maths. You know, he is he is good at connecting things up and questioning established ways of thinking about things, which is, you know, I'm not saying that established ways of thinking about things are bad and we should reject them, but I find it interesting that he's open to other forms of knowledge and um, more complex systems. Provocation, I don't know people, whether people will agree with that, with their own experiences with children, but um, that's, I think there's some interesting things going on there. So I think the students are great <laughs> and I really like teaching them and I learn those from them. Uh, I then I'm part of the Digital Cultures Research Center at UWE, which, um, is is where we've been thinking about these things and the impact of computers on knowledge production you know, for a number of years. And we are based in the Pervasive Media Studio, which is, as it says here, diverse community exploring creative technology, a home for early ideas and companies, and a studio offering space, events, and opportunities. So this is about impact. You know, it stops us being in our ivory towers. It brings universities into contact with creative businesses, with young uh, entrepreneurs, with the creative arts, uh, with the media ecology, if you like, of Bristol and the Southwest. And then it's also, you know, connected globally with other similar studios. So it's a really, it's a really great place to be looking at complexity and wicked problems. So two things I'm involved with is the RAI Film Festival. So as an anthropologist, um, the Royal Anthropological Institute has a film festival every other year with an associated conference. Currently, it's based in Bristol, which is brilliant for me. Brings together anthropologists, uh, filmmakers, um, not just scholars, but people who are interested in anthropology, whose films kind of speak to anthropology uh, from literally all over the world. So, you know, looking at alternative forms of storytelling, such as Aboriginal Indigenous storytelling. This year, we collaborated with the ICA in London and brought uh, a number of Brazilian filmmakers over and um, they showed their films and a conversation about listening, listen to the weather and about in Indigenous knowledge systems. And we were also very honoured to have Alanis Abomso in, in conversation with Faye Ginsberg. She came over. Alanis is a, a very um, revered Indigenous filmmaker from, from Canada, probably the most well-known. Um, she's 90 now, and she still came over to Bristol. And uh, she's been amplifying Indigenous voices in Canada for throughout her career. And she's famous. This is a pretty hard-hitting statement. But she said, when the last tree is cut, the last fish is caught and the last river is polluted, when to breathe the air is sickening, you will realise too late that wealth is not in bank accounts and that you can't eat money. Um, she is one of those people who just her presence was really powerful and very calm, very um, inspirational and, and very determined to make films um, that bring through alternative knowledge systems and that question injustices and so forth. So she was in Bristol in March for our festival. So the other thing I am heavily involved with is IDOCS, which for those of you who haven't heard of it, is a research strand within the Digital Culture Centre at UWE. Um, and we held the first symposium dedicated to interactive documentary in 2011. Since then, we've held four more international symposia with Mandy Rose joining us uh, as well. Um, the most recent was in March 2018. We did have another one all arranged for March 2020, but it was literally the week after lockdown started. So we had to cancel that. Um, but we've got a website and a Facebook group, uh, Facebook, and um, 
we've you know been kind of we're now known internationally as as a, a key area for looking at evolving documentary practices and now rather than convening large-scale conferences which are very kind of time consuming and keeping up all the time with the latest developments we do something called idocs community conversations so we hold more ad hoc events we, we do collaborations with people um and we do online com conferences and conversations that can bring in more people but lots of people are saying are you going to do another idocs because they what idocs did was it really brought industry into the picture in in a conversation so people who are interested in emerging forms like the director of mozilla like huge big producers from france from the canadian film board from india you know from all over in, in a genuine conversational environment. So it, it wasn't really a, a marketplace, although people who came found it a very productive way of um, meeting new people and sharing ideas across industry and academia. And that's just, you know, that picture, just kind of the early idea of nonlinear, interactive, computer-based ways of working with um, not just film, but still images, sound, audio, all the rest of it. So, you know, that's where it kind of began. And then in 2011, we had Alexandra Brache, just again, for those of you who aren't familiar with what we mean by interactive documentary and now also immersive documentary in XR. So Brache, this is where it began. He came in 2011, a massive producer from um, from Paris, kind of leading the way in the industry, and that's that's available on our website, the documentation of our first symposium, and this was the classic Gaza Sederot project produced in 20, 2008, um, which was a, about Israel and Palestine, and in times of war, let's talk about peace. And this was the project that related to the own my own work that I'd been doing in the interactive multimedia industry where you've got video clips across Gaza and across Sederot and you've got um, an, an interface in the middle where each dot represents one day one of 40 days they had six film crews working across in local film crews in Gaza and Sederot filming everyday life and then they put them onto this website so you could put them alongside each other and you could explore the similarities across the um, political divide you know not just the differences so and you could go in through um, this is through the date so you could literally watch each one each set of clips over the 40 days or you could you know go in non-linearly you could then go in through faces so you start to get to know certain characters that appear across several days so you can say I want to see all the clips from that person or all the clips from that person you're going through a map um, you know people's houses or you could go in thematically uh, and start to look at you know intersecting themes so that's your classic web doc at the beginning of kind of broadband when suddenly it was all convergence it was all coming together and some might say well you know that's the web docs dead now but for me the principle is still there and it's that core principle of juxtaposition multi-perspectivism that's what drew me into setting up IDOCs in the first place. And, you know, I'm sort of saying to myself, what is what is my particular interest? And it is in this. And so for me, um, IDOCs is a way of thinking uh, as much as it is a certain specific set of technologies or platforms. So I'm interested in how that way of thinking that comes out of documentary still has traction. And I believe that it does very much still have traction. And it's about the danger of a single story. This is a great talk on TED, TED Talk, that, that is saying, you know, the single story only gives one point of view. And, you know, filmmaking, yes, you can have multiple films that can give you multiple points of view. But within a IDOC, you can have those multiple points of view embedded into this, you know, the single system so that you can start to juxtapose and compare and start, they can start to, debate with each other. I mean, obviously you can have more than one character in a linear film, but that's edited to a line, to a timeline, whereas these interactive pieces are more durational. You can come, you know, they're not necessarily designed to be viewed in one sitting. 
um, they're just a different a different way of engaging with multi perspective multi perspectival thinking. I'm saying I'm not saying IDOX is the only way, but I'm saying again it should be part of these debates should be part of our media production landscape. And then this was just a tweet from one of our symposia. Interactive documentary appeals because the world is complicated. There's not always one story, but many intersecting, you know, and that can be within. You've got transmedia stuff where it's across platforms and across pieces of work, but also an IDOC, it's within the piece itself. And um, the meta archival documentaries as a way to resist power structures, stay staying open to interpretation, you know, the multiple perspectives is important. So it goes to this idea that everything is deeply intertwingled, which comes from Ted Nelson, uh, an early computer pioneer. And this is going back again to my point about YouTube and the interconnectivity of, of knowledge. Um, so that he was um, an inspirational thinker in the early days of the internet. And if you want to know more about why I think interactive documentary is important, and why I think we need interactive alongside immersive. Interactive is more about agency. Immersive is more about presence. You know, we need to put those into dialogue. And it's great to see that interactive as a word is coming back. And we're thinking, you know, what's this? A conference on interactive storytelling. So that's brilliant. So that's a blog post on the IDOX website that I wrote. Then this was a symposium. We did a one day event last summer. So this was an IDOX collaboration on IDOX crisis and multi-perspectival thinking. It's all documented on the IDOX website. And then I um, wrote, co-wrote with the, the postdoc person that I was collaborating with on that symposium. We wrote together a thought piece on how IDOX, an interactive documentary as a way of thinking is helpful for uncertain times. So that's on the website as well. So going to the polyphonic documentary project. So in a way, um, polyphony it, it takes us back to that original motivation for setting up IDOX. So for me, polyphony is the bit of IDOX and this big constellation because the I means interactive, now, immersive as well as interactive and XR and you know all these evolving platforms. But I'm particularly looking at how all that relates to this idea of polyphony and multi-perspectivalism. So I set up a project uh, with a colleague, Stefano Odorico. This is our website, polyphonicdocumentary.com. Um, and in that, what we're doing is we're looking at, okay, so we need kind of new ways of thinking. And in a way we're saying, well, the first step for that is to check, is to look at yourself and to see how how through our practice we can change ourselves so we're working this is a community of people from around the world from idox who kind of share this core interest in in the multi-perspectivity and polyphony and uh, we're co-creating together a model for new approaches for polyphonic documentary focusing on interactive forms we're testing out ideas we're doing small projects using mobile devices it's explicitly low tech it's not about you know, fancy aesthetics. It, it's about structures, processes, you know, ways of thinking. So we're creating a community of makers with a theoretical underpinning and a practical approach. We're doing that through collective reading, collective sharing of projects and practices, and collective use of tools. And, you know, most of the people in that group, we are makers. And, you know, most of us have worked commercially as well as working in universities. Um, and we have two developers, you know, commercial well, developers of software tools for interactive documentary uh, working with us in the project. So we're, we're trying not to be kind of in an ivory tower and just all academic about this, but we're constantly thinking, what's its application? Collective sharing of projects and practices, what's its application in the real world? You know, where does this have traction? Where, where can this be a sustainable business model? Um, all the, all the rest of it so um but we have got a bit of theory so Bakhtin is a russian was a russian um philosopher from the 20th century a very a very famous um philosopher who talked about the polyphonic novel 
and we're looking at how those ideas can apply into evolving practices within media. And you just said, this is 1963, truth isn't born or found inside the head of an individual. It's born between people collectively searching for truth in the process of their dialogic interaction. So this is all about dialogue. And in the polyphonic novel, the idea is when he was writing, there was still an author, a single author, but that author um, put themselves into dialogue with their characters. So they weren't bringing their characters into, if you think about that in filmmaking, into what is the point of view of the director. It's less explicit and the author, or if you're making a film, the director, still has a point of view, but that is much more open-ended and in dialogue with the characters. So it creates um, a less, um, well, it, it allows for more multiple voices, multiple perspectives, multiple windows, platforms and screens in the case of technology. But importantly, it moves away from monologue, you know, the monologic idea of the single point of view. You know, often when you make a film, it's like, what's your point of view? Um, to a more dialogic way of thinking about things. And again, I'm not saying the polyphonic novel, the polyphonic film is the only type of film we should be making, not at all, but that it's it's important we, we should be thinking about this and we, we should be thinking about how we can get, get more dialogism in our films, which might be appropriate in certain contexts and certainly when dealing with complex situations and ideas, dealing with climate and ideological polarization you know where we need debate and that's so important and how can we do that through our media making so we are using tools so Korsakoff is one of the software tools this has been around for a long time uh, Florian Talhofer invented it in Berlin as an MA student he's now doing a PhD with me for his sins you know reflecting on what Korsakoff is and what you know, where, where its value still lies. But it's a non-linear authoring tool for putting video clips into relation with each other rather than in sequence. It's a relational tool where um, it's kind of forward looking. So you, you put your clips into Korsakoff and instead of getting a timeline, it refuses to give you a mind map or a timeline. And so it surprises you, you put keywords in and then all the clips that you've put in, they'll come at you in, well, it, they can be totally random if you just give everything the same keyword or you can start to cluster clips into clouds of, you know, related areas. And then you, you can create an interface where you've got more than one window. So the clips are in dialogue with each other. And as I say, it doesn't, it doesn't give you a preview. That's not the point, the point is, you, you kind of each time it, it will show you something new and, and it's a tool for thinking, for discovering new relationships between your clips and for making nonlinear experiences and narratives with them. And then we're working with Stornaway, which based in Bristol, um, they're known as the WordPress of interactive authoring. I imagine some of you will have heard of them by now, but they're... Um, they're going great guns as a really e simple and easy to use interactive video storytelling platform. Uh, this is based on the idea of story islands. So um, rather than having really complex branch narratives that the mapping gets really complex, the arrows can come back and you can add different. So you can have um, what's that one and two. First time you come to this, it might have a certain piece of narrative voiceover. The next time you come to it, it's moved on and the voiceover's changed. You don't need a separate kind of box for it to mind map it. it it's, it's much simpler to conceptualize. And this is previewable all the time. So this is the opposite from Korsakoff in that you can preview and it does give you a, a map in your head to kind of map out what you're doing. So it does works differently. So there's the uh, there's a map typical map of a project. So just quickly, this is um, a piece I wrote, interactive documentary, Resetting the Field, that kind of talks about all these ideas. We set up this project, we did a panel in 2018. This is um, an, a scholarly article, a collection of articles about that panel, talking about it. This is our launch of the project, all available on the IDOCS website. 
And then this is the actual project where, you know, we, we work on Zoom. There's about 100 people from all over the globe working with us from the IDOCS community, exploring in, in a very collaborative and fun way, um, exploring new possibilities. We're on Discord. There's about 100 of us on there. And then when we set a particular project, usually about 30 people are active contributors. We ask people to send in three to five clips. This first project was on what does polyphony mean to you? Put them all into a big pot and then everybody signs a collaboration agreement where we're free to remix and work with those materials. We are using, because Florian and Rue from Korsakoff and Stornoway are part of our group, those are the tools we're concentrating on at the moment. Uh, on our website, the results of these two things are there for people to look at. Uh, the, it's important to stress that these are not we're not making end products. We're making products to in order to better understand and work together to think through what these possibilities are. And then the next step that we're coming to will be to think, OK, how can we use these new processes in in community settings, in business settings? You know, where where is this way of thinking and working? Where does it have traction and how do we roll that out and how does it work when we're working with other communities? And probably in a more par participatory, less genuinely co-creational way, uh, but that's the next step. So these might they might seem weird because they're not aimed at an external audience necessarily. So we put this was Korsakoff put them all in a big pot. Um, there's you know clips. They're all video clips. You can you know explore explore them in a sort of tiled way. And then we started, we had big debates about how to organize them. We organized them here by place. So you can look at all the clips from Bangalore or you can, they start to come along the bottom, other random clips. So you can follow a sequence of clips or you can juxtapose different clips. Uh, and then with Storn Away, a more formal system of organizing. So rather than having all the clips in a big pot, this organized them into chapters. So we organized a set of clips from four different places for chapter one, chapter two, another four different places. So it's a bit more structured. And then you could see this was a, a screenshot from one of the clips, and then you can start to explore by place. And then when you've looked at all the clips from the different places, you can then go to the next chapter. And when you go in, they come along. So it, it's a more structured way of working and we're comparing the two. So there's chapter two. Um, but the point is, it's and this is about relational thinking, less sequential thinking, less about causality, less about kind of finding endings. It's more open ended. It's more like indigenous knowledge systems, more like using film to find new patterns. So sometimes we're exploring these clips by by theme, sometimes by color, allowing our thoughts to develop and, and to respond to the clips as, as they come in. And this relational way of thinking, there's a lot of discussion about that as it relates to other knowledge systems and perhaps to the way YouTube works. So nonlinear, more speculative, make new and potentially surprising connections, reconsidering approaches to process and teamwork. So more collective ways of working, less hierarchical ways of working, new ways of thinking about narrative, building on cross-cultural approaches to narrative, Drama is found in across every culture. So there's a reason why that's a successful business model for filmmaking. But I would argue in some cultures, it's more dominant than in others. And when it becomes the only way that we have a thinking about narrative, that's where we have a problem. When we start to believe that conflict is the essence of human nature and drama, and that's all there is to human nature, that's when it becomes a problem. So in relation to that, you know, it's thinking about how we interact. One of the little bit of theory from anthropologist Tim Ingold, he talks about corresponding rather than interactive. It's another story with other people and with the more than human, you know, how we interact with the environment, how we give agency. You know, there's there's um, places now that are giving agency to rivers and to lakes. There's There's a national river park just being set up and, you know, new ways of thinking about how we relate to the environment. So that's it. That's the website. So there's a blog. Um, the initial results of collaborative project part one and part two are there. 
that will take you to the Korsakoff and to the Stornoway pieces. Part one is Storn Korsakoff, part two is um, Stornoway, and then that's just contact and if you want to get in touch with us. So um, I will stop there and see what questions come out. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you, Judith. That was really, really interesting. And um, yeah, it was. It, I was very interested to ask you about the sort of processes. And and so it sounds like a lot of what you're doing, as you say, is is more about understanding new processes rather than final outputs. Mm. Um, I just wondered if the, if there are any that can be kind of um, wrapped up into to something that that something simple any of those processes that are the kind of working better than others yeah um i mean there's a lot of talk i'm involved with uh, a kind of international group that is looking at co-creation and participatory um, processes in um, filmmaking and media production and i think co-creation is working actually co-creation is really hard to do um, in a genuinely equal way but co-creation is working in this project at the moment because we are all from the same community. We're all within the IDOCS community. But as interest in this grows, kind of people from outside that community are interested in joining and, you know, we want to collaborate. But then, so, but then that kind of potentially, because we don't know people so well, we're not from within the same community anymore, that, then would probably make genuine co-creation harder. We, we try that out. But then also when we look at taking it into, you know, commissioned projects or where I've got a project working in Avonmouth that's just getting going around rivers and energy futures um, in, in a very industrialized suburb of Bristol. And then I think then it would that will probably be more participatory rather because I think co-creation is quite idealistic in a lot of contexts. And Kat Seasek at MIT talks a lot about that, about staying with the trouble um, and how, you know, it, it's not easy, but it's important. But participatory kind of recognizes more that there's power structures and, you know, there are inevitable hierarchies. So that's something that's come out that, you know, co-creation isn't, isn't always the right form to be using anyway. Yeah. And in terms of kind of, um, I mean, I personally, I find it hard to track, you know, current contemporary examples of, of good work that's out there. I just wondered if you had any examples of sort of more recent, more recent and more, um, more recent examples of interactive documentary, perhaps using these formats or as kind of extensions of the old, web, older web format, web documentary. Yeah. Format. I mean, this this book, Collective Wisdom, was a, a kind of field guide to to these new processes. And there's lots of examples in here. So that that book, it's a PDF. Um, but there's the Folk Memory Project in China, which is really interesting, which is um, encouraging when when students go back to their family home, encouraging them to make recordings with their families and um Put them onto this ever evolving website so that that's it's this idea of nested narratives you know and and the you can have these clouds and clusters of narratives um, that you can explore in a kind of database environment so that's a really good example and there's the detroit narrative agency that are doing amazing work with um kind of justice and equity and um, they talk about collective wisdom it, it, it's a it's only wise when when is it wise you know and what 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 are the wise ways of working with media and story for a sustainable future so there's, there's some really good examples in there brilliant great thank you well um really appreciate it you coming to talk to us and um that's all we've got time for um but yeah really really much appreciate it and, and these links will be available on the video to kind of replay so hopefully people could find you and some of those projects uh via the the video replay so um yeah. and yeah so just to stress you know this is about bringing these things 
to the table so that they sit alongside other ways of working. I'm, I'm not I'm not sort of planning a revolution or a takeover. It's, it's just opening up the discussion, really. So and I, I've got a couple of other things to do, but I'll come to as much as I can for the rest of the day. It's really great talks. So great. thank Brilliant. you. All right. Thank you so much. Excellent. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye bye. bye, -bye.